Well, this is kind of intimidating, setting up this final week. And I've got this text-heavy thing on the first page, which I'm going to add um, this video to at the bottom. So let me go into the module itself and we're at the same page but it gets a little bit more colorful and easy to follow here a couple of surveys here just for you to kind of contemplate um, think about how your process is going kind of a check-in what you've done and what you can uh, do over the last two weeks the self-assessment Simple things there. Those are for Monday. And then a lot of content for this week. It could be kind of intimidating. Um, it is a lot, but it's a six semester class and I didn't, uh, layer on a lot of work during the essay week. So, by the way, we do have an essay due on the 21st, the last day of class. But we'll get to that and I'll have that prompt for you Monday morning. But for right now, a couple of simple activities on uh, Monday. Tuesday, we're going to be uh, reviewing the movie and then moving into a whole new layer of content, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, Wednesday, we're going to be doing the same with that content, just taking it a little bit uh, deeper. This is going to be kind of fun. Thursday, another, again, short content. These aren't 45-page uh, chapters of Merchants of Doubt. And then Friday, kind of an, ult, uh, an ultimate and final uh, bit of analysis for you with a follow-up discussion on Monday. That doesn't tell you a lot at the top. But what we're going to look at is we're going to look at political messaging. And I kind of have a, I think, well worth reading 5.5, give you an idea of um, it can be good, it can inspire people. As we see, President Bush, 9-11, President Clinton, one of the most inspirational speakers as well, Kamala Harris, very fiery and inspirational as a candidate. And then we also get the idea of how messaging works, how 88% of Democrats believe climate change is a concern, and only 31% of Republicans do. And then I like to uh, add that when you get to Republicans under the age of 35, the percentages get up to about the same as uh, Democrats. The younger generation knows it's real. And so, and this is all a result of messaging. This is climate change denial through the voices of politicians and media heads getting batted around the echo chamber of conservative media saying it isn't happening. That's just the way it is. It's really kind of disgusting, actually, but nonetheless. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at Frank Luntz. He's a political... He's not just a pollster. He's also a message maker. What I mean, how that works together, is he calls thousands of voters and asks them test questions to figure out which messages really work with the voters. And he did that, as I mentioned in my uh, voice thread uh, for this lesson, he did that in 1992, uh, pardon me, 2002, to help Republicans in the midterm elections because they were very unpopular when it came to the environment because President Bush had pulled out of the very popular Kyoto Agreement on climate, an agreement President Bush and President Clinton had signed into, forgive me, kind of getting uh, turned around here at the end of the day. So I want you to go through the talking points and imagine, not about facts, but imagine what emotional buttons they will push in the voters. And I have a voice thread on that and a voice thread on um, uh, uh, how to write about it as well and how to do that assignment. So it's not really deeply time consuming, but it's a different type of thing. You're not going to read through a very long chapter like Merchants of Doubt and then analyze four or five page sections, what you're doing here is taking short talking points like that little box there, this little box here, and you are um, explaining how that message will work on the voters, how it will work on their emotions, because when you deal with low information voters, 
the goal is to trigger their emotions, not to inform them. And uh, these uh, messages here are very effective from 20 years ago. Turn people uh, against climate change, against scientists, against international agreements, because they play with their emotions. They know how to frame those things and get the voters to believe that we don't want to do any of that. Very effective manipulation. Here's Luntz, Luntz's larger document, but we're only going to start digging deeply into it on about page 10 or so. I'm kind of scrolling through now, and maybe it's a little bit later. Um, maybe it's a little bit later, earlier, sorry, somewhere in there, anyway. Ding, 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 I don't want to scroll around. For, yeah, winning the global warming debate. So these are the talking points. Talking points are made so politicians who don't have enough time to think can at least have something to say. And if they're all saying the same thing, well, so much the better. Then it sounds like it must be true. That's the idea. Okay, now how do I get out of this dang thing? I don't know. I wish it would just go away. Oh, next. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you to first analyze how a handful of those talking points trigger emotions in the voters, the supportive um, voice threads for that. And then we're going to go into the next level, which is, and I'll give you an example of the uh, essay coming up. We might have a little bit more complexity there, but this is how you write about Luntz. Then we go into what's really kind of fun here is the talking heads. And I've got um, probably uh, seven of them. Little short, like minute long video clips. And I'm going to go back out into the module here because I don't want to click through all of those. It'll take a week and a half. But when you go, you know, five, seven, talking heads. This is These are all Trump's cabinet members. And guess what? They're using Lund's talking points. Um, Secretary of the Interior, Zinke, he's using Lund's talking points. Oh, a little bit of Fox News, Sean Hannity, he's using Lund's talking points. Um, Energy Secretary Perry, he's using Lund's talking points. Ted Cruz, just a, one of the finest liars we have. He's using Lund's talking points. And uh, Pruitt, my God. Uh, just an amazing, amazing liar. He's one of the best. And he uses so many talking points. And then Zinke, I have to give him another one because he's just so good. And these are all short segments, you know, two, three minutes, three, four minutes. But I want you to be able to, be able to connect what they're saying with the lunch talking point. Why am I doing this? Because they're not speaking to inform people. They're speaking to trigger the emotions of the voters, and they're speaking to be consistent with the climate denial message. They've read Luntz's talking points. They're on message. They're all singing from the same book. And when everybody does that, it starts sounding like the truth, even though, of course, it is a very, very big lie. And then a short video on Fox News, um, just kind of a compilation of climate denial, and then a fun debate from down under, that is Australia, where... Uh, um, a Fox executive is getting attacked by the PM in Australia and just, uh, you know, we're tired of your lies. And then we're going to end this with uh, tribalism and trust. We've got Rush Limbaugh, the former extraordinarily popular conservative radio host. And I want you to understand how he takes the Heritage Foundation as gospel. Why do I want you to understand that? Because... This is how it works. You get the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, largely but not exclusively funded by oil interests, and they put out position papers that look really good. If we had an eight-week class, we'd dig into this. By God, we'd go into it. But one of the cool things you learn when you dig into it is that, first off, virtually all of the 73 footnotes are bogus. What do I mean by bogus? This one here, the first one, has nothing to do with the text. This one garbles John Kerry. Um, and then Ligotti's soon climate denialist. Just William Happer, climate denialist. And you keep going to Cato Institute, like Heritage, climate denial. Curry, climate denial. And you just walk through this, and most of their footnotes are either completely off the topic, in other words, is just garbage. The word for that is woozle, when you support something with faulty citation, 
or their fellow climate denialists. I'm reminded years ago of a kind of a wingnut relation who had books on Holocaust denial, and he was very impressed with all the footnotes. Well, the footnotes were other Holocaust denialists. <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, everybody else in the world knows that millions of Jews were killed by the Nazis, but Holocaust denialists, no, 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 that's a Jewish plot to get money for Israel. So it's, you can't talk to these people. But anyway, this is just about as reliable as Holocaust denial when it comes to the footnotes. And also, they're very cunning. Um, everything they talk about is something that threatens the oil industry. The consensus, 97%, higher now, that was 10 years ago, of climatologists believe, uh, you know, climate change is something that we really need to address. 97%, and that we're causing it. So they attack that, and they twist, and they garble, and they just basically yank and pull, and they're, you know, very dishonest about the whole thing. But that's why they do it. Biases in climate research. We know the real biases come from climate denial, but they start making it sound like the scientists have a political agenda. It's not really about science. It's about, you know, you play with our team, or you don't get anything. We, we don't listen to you. And we attack you, which is, you know, exactly what the denialists are doing. And then a brief history on global climate change. This is the one that in the next um, activity you'll see um, Mr. Trump uses this. What they're doing is they're suggesting that, hey, the medieval warming period, we were warm before, we're warm now. All it is is just a big natural rhythm that has nothing to do with CO2, that is with fossil fuels. Really good. It takes fossil fuels off the hook. It's entirely untrue. But as you'll see in the next activity with Mr. Trump, people in this tribe believe it's true because they read it at the Heritage Foundation. It's just, we're just part of this long, 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 noisy trip here. No big thing. Totally wrong. Because if you look at the actual graph, this is kind of like, you know, um, the BS they did with Hansen's graph in the 189 or so from emergence of doubt, is that there's a gradual trend that suddenly gets, they call it the hockey stick with the Industrial Revolution. The temperatures really ramp up in ways that are out of alignment with anything that's happened for 400,000 years. But no, they know how to cherry pick and distort, and they do a great job, and they convince, hey, guess what? You know, the former occupant of the White House. And then finally, they, uh, you know, continue on the attack, the temperature readings can't be relied upon, can't trust those scientists. Uh, the climate models have nothing to do with reality, can't trust those scientists. And you have to know we're not getting more frequent natural disasters, can't trust the scientists. And everything they do is supported by climate denialists, liars, cherry picking, all those insidious things we learned about. But unfortunately, we don't have time to go into this great deception. But I just want you to give you a background, because if you look at this section here, uh, what the scientific data tells us about climate change, if you were to dig deeply into that, what you would find, oops, 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 if you look at this set, yeah, here, pardon me, a brief history on global climate change and where we are today, you get the kind of information or disinformation that inspired Mr. Trump to say what he does in the next slide. So... All I can say is that this is well worth, you know, six or eight hours of tearing apart and looking at the language and looking at the footnotes and looking at the people cited, but we don't have any time. So I want to use that as kind of a background, going back to what we're doing. The heritage is uh, a very conservative think tank, and when it comes to climate, they're a fossil fuel front group. And these people, Limbaugh's millions of viewers, if they believed Limbaugh, they didn't believe in climate change. And you better believe that Mr. Trump's millions of listeners and tweetards and other people, if they uh, believe him, they don't believe in climate change either. And here I have uh, from Skeptical Science a rebuttal of the lies he tells. So that's another thing we don't get to do. And I wish we had time to, but this is just too quick. And that would be, if you look at any of the claims here, all you have to do is look at Google medieval warming period skeptical science. 
and they will rebut the denialists. This is a group of people, of climatologists, who are skeptical about climate denial. Instead of being climate skeptics, they're skeptical scientists. And and uh, the consensus, all you have to do is look at 97% skeptical science, and they'll show you exactly how climate denialists lie about that. It's really quite good. Or if you look at temperature readings, skeptical science, you'll realize how the denialists try to say that the temperature readings aren't accurate. But that's another story, and we just don't have time for that. Uh, unfortunately, we're kind of <laughs> near the end. So and, and let me synthesize that down a little bit. I want you to know the heritage as I explained it. I want you to know how it inspired Rush Limbaugh. And I want you to know that there are lies about our climate being no different than the medieval warming period climate are repeated by Mr. Trump. And if you want to know the rebuttal of that, look here. And that's the end. I'm going to end on the note where the person with the most influence, of at least the biggest speaking platform of almost anybody in the world, is a climate denialist. And he has no doubts about it, as he has no doubts about anything else. And where we do, what we do at the end of this is we end where we begin. We end where we begin, the class through line in one image. <clears throat> we end with all this think tank denialism, the Koch brothers, American Petroleum Institute, ExxonMobil, the Mercer families, politicians, we're going to look at this week, think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, the Heartland Institute you've heard about, in this river of denial, and here we have Mr. Trump pulling out of the Paris Agreement. And that really is what we're doing, is we're looking at how this disinformation has developed over time. And in this current week, we'll look at how it really gets, well, how the, how this disinformation gets disseminated, or if you want to say when the rubber hits the road, how this bends the minds of millions of voters. And that's what this week's about. I will put the essay at prompt up tomorrow. That is Monday. I really uh, want to congratulate all of you for wrestling through all of this. It's a big, big bit of work to do in such a short haul. I'll be correcting your essays next week. See you tomorrow night if you have some time. Monday night, what the heck, 7 to 8, I believe. All right.